you you mentioned before we went on the air, you mentioned that the best conversation for Mulholland Drive involves a conversation for the best conversation about Mulholland Drive. <laughs> and in true David Lynch fashion, it confused me so much that uh, I agreed that it must be the right thing to do. <laughs> well, you and I have been prepping for this for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we started with Blue Velvet and we did Lost Highway. Mm-hmm. And Lost Highway, I actually feel like kind of sets the precedent for some of the things we're going to talk about happening in Mulholland Drive. Yeah. So Mulholland Drive was the first David Lynch movie I had ever seen, and I despised it. I loathed it. It was, God, we, it was several years before our show, which means it was probably about a decade ago, which is pretty crazy to think. Uh But I had put away David Lynch for a long time. I kind of gotten mad at him and we've talked about that. Sure. And then came back around to these other films and to Twin Peaks, which I love. And now I'm seeing Mulholland Drive again and loving it think it's fantastic right but was a little frightened to do it on our show because it seems like one of the hardest david lynch movies to understand probably second hardest well we've done eraserhead and uh we did the straight story as well and wild at heart but eraserhead was it was purposefully obscure you mm-hmm. know it it wants to look obscure it's film studenty uh you can chalk a lot of that up to I mean, unfairly, but you could chalk a lot of that up too. It's an early David Lynch film. Maybe he didn't know what he was doing yet. I don't understand it. And you run away from it. (laughs) You can't do that with Mulholland Drive. Right. I mean, you really shouldn't do it with Eraserhead either. But Mulholland Drive is, I think a lot of people would agree that it's the peak of David Lynch. Yeah. It's some of the best he's ever done. So for me, Mulholland Drive, I'd seen a little bit later. I think Lost Highway or... Blue Velvet was the first one I'd seen. Mm -hmm. Did not get it, but totally loved it. And so what I think makes Mulholland Drive so scary for me as somebody, I mean, I consider myself a David Lynch fan. Sure. David Lynch. Haven't seen a single thing he's done that I didn't like. Right. That includes episodes of Louie. Yeah. That includes (laughs) Inland Empire. David Lynch has done some interesting things since, uh, (laughs) since we last talked. But yeah, I haven't seen Inland Empire, but, but with the exception of that, I mean, I've seen I've seen Rabbits. The thing that scares me most about Mulholland Drive, and this shouldn't surprise any of Podmanity who have been on this 300 episode journey with us, or at least like the last six. <laughs> yeah, right. Mulholland Drive got a ton of critical acclaim. It got Academy nominations. Mm-hmm. It got Golden Globe nominations. And do you know what right. that means to me, Eric? It means everybody's hip to David Lynch finally. But it also means everybody gets it or everybody's pretending they get it. (laughs) Right. And so here's the thing. I've now seen Mulholland Drive with this viewing five times. The fourth time, I was sure as fuck that I understood it. Sure. I don't know anymore. I completely for I I either forgot my understanding or it reinvented itself in confusion. But I wholeheartedly believe that all of those people who nominated this film, I truly believe they loved the film because like I said, upon my first viewing, I knew that it was something great, but I'm slowly realizing and kudos to David Lynch for teaching me this. You don't have to get something to love it and to know it's great. Well, that's the, and, and we will uh, definitely try and hash this out. Sure. Very interested. Well, there's, there's points of understanding for sure but to address what you're saying i think that's the biggest thing i've learned through watching these other david lynch movies best thing you can do to understand all and drive is watch other david lynch films Mm -hmm. and you see when uh he's doing something that's just sort of a david lynch thing or when he comes at something in blue velvet we talked about that comes at it from an idea the ear and he starts there and builds a film around it blue velvet which i actually just saw uh, I watched it the day before I watched Mulholland Drive for the show. I mean, it seems painfully narrative compared to Mulholland Drive. Right. You're just like, wow, you're going to tell me where the beginning, the middle, and the end is, huh? Mm-hmm. But Blue Velvet is one of my favorite. David Lynch films, one of my favorite films. We saw Lost Highway, and we talked about this idea of a highway at night also appearing in Mulholland Drive and appearing in Blue Velvet. David Lynch loves his highway at night. But he starts with an image. He starts with a feeling. And just knowing that, you can watch Mulholland Drive and go, well, maybe we're just talking about feelings. Mm -hmm. Or at the very least, if that's all I get out of it, that's okay. And that was a hard spot for me to be in the first time I saw it. 
And I think coming to grips with that, like you said, I mean, that's an important kind of lesson to be taught and really helps you wrap your head around the film when you know you don't have to understand it in order to like it, then you can be on board. Mm -hmm. You can go, okay, well, I don't have to understand this, but I'm going to try anyways. And I think that helps a little bit. This is also something that uh, Ebert famously said, there is no explanation for Mulholland Drive. In fact, there may not even be a mystery. And I think that idea of there may not, you might be asking questions that's, what if there is no mystery here and you're Mm -hmm. making a mystery out of nothing? And so with that in mind, I do really want to dissect it. But yeah, I wanted to kind of, I don't know, lay ground rules or talk about the best way. Here's my idea on this. And before we even launch into it, I'm totally open to, we can run this show as long as you want today and we can figure out how to best have this conversation because it's episode 300 and we finally arrived at Mahal and Drive and this is our crack at it. I feel like the best thing to do might be to go through key points of the film chronologically and then once we hit the end, the lingering questions that need to be addressed. Okay. I don't want to beat by beat go through every single thing that happens in the film, Mm -hmm. although I do think that's an exercise that may help, especially if you're seeing it for the first time, is find a fucking plot synopsis of this somewhere and just Mm -hmm. make sure you're on board with everything you're seeing is the same thing everybody else is seeing, because that's hard enough. But there's key things that I think are going to come up later in the film. Mm -hmm. And as you alluded to at the beginning of the show, there's a a definitive moment where we have two characters who seem to be two other characters. Right. We could probably agree with that. I would say two actors that are two other characters. Yeah. Sure. Got it. And in the interest of time, I'm also going to address your other question about its popularity and give my hand-waving unfair explanation of everybody just thinks this movie's a dream. That's why they're okay with it. Uh Uh-huh. So that's the popular consensus. Oh, I got it. No, no, no. It's a dream, which I don't know, maybe an okay interpretation of it. But also, as we've talked about, it's a useless exercise because every, you know, Shark Boy and Lava Girl was Max's dream. Sure. You know what I mean? Right. Every movie is somebody's dream. It doesn't fucking matter. Do these sound like uh, pretty fair terms and conditions of our... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think then so. Then we'll hit the, the mystery points and we can reference things that we have previously talked about. Okay. The big first, uh, I mean, the every fucking scene's a mystery. I don't know how it yeah. starts on that weird dancing, you know, mm. whatever thing. But maybe we'll come back around to that. Uh, there is the alley person, the infamous uh-huh. dumpster person. Right. And we've referenced this several times on the show sure. before. Well, it's it's well noted as one of the scariest moments in cinema history. It's why Mulholland Drive is up there for one of the scariest films of all time. Well, so let me ask you about this because mm-hmm. uh, we've it's come up so many times and we've never gotten our moment to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But before we really launch into the, the crazy reality-defying things, uh, is this one of the scariest things you've ever seen? Oh, absolutely. But... I think in a bizarre way. Now, you and I, this is this is probably the most comfortable conversation we're going to have today on Mulholland Drive. We've done horror. Mm-hmm. We know what makes a thing make you jump, and we know what makes a thing scare you. Sure. I feel like literally anything could come out from behind that wall. <laughs> right. And just... There's another meme waiting to happen here. Based on the treatment of, of what, like how it moves... And Uh the man's reaction. Yeah. I feel like your heart is going to fall out of your chest no matter what. I could feel it beating inside when I watch it. it, It's not. I mean, I live in Chicago. People that look like that are walking up and down the street. (laughs) Right. Right. So it's not necessarily the visage of the alley person. Mm -hmm. It's these beats in that kind of vignette within the film. Yeah. Where he's talking about the dream and it's I It's mean, already kind of scary when he's talking sure. about it. Well, again, this is this is another moment where I don't know if it's if it's acting choices or directorial micromanagement. In either case, it's artistically satisfying. The performance of the guy talking about the dream. Mm-hmm. He seems to be absolutely shaken to the core yeah and yeah. constantly masking every other sentence with kind of a wry smile uh almost door-to-door salesman like level of happy confidence 
masking yeah. the if I don't make my quota, my little girl is going to starve. Yeah, right. And he seems to almost be pitching this idea to get it bounced back. Mm -hmm. And the guy that he's with gets up and goes over to the counter and he doesn't have to turn around for the audience to go, hey, um, yeah, your dream's happening again. Yeah. Well, you're right. You see how shaken he is. And I think that sells so much of it. Yeah. Because that's the other thing that's interesting to me. I would agree with you that this is one of the scariest things. It's, you know, it's on that list on par with the the infamy of the insidious mm -hmm. uh, scene that we talked about. And both of those actually are scenes that don't use the super typical right. methods. The When we finally get to the dumpster person... It's not jumping out, you know, at right. lightning quick speed with a shrill sound. He's sitting there, he's describing it, and, and you feel it, and you're really in the moment with him, and then it starts happening right in front of you. He's just described, you know, he would rather die than see this thing again, and you go, oh, well, okay, hopefully we don't get to that later in the movie. Oh, my God, it's happening now. Make it not happen. And there's that sort of omen shot of him paying. Mm-hmm. You're right. We don't need to see it. Right. But once we do, it makes it real. And so he's going, okay, well, let's just go. Let's just go back there. It's no big deal. Shakily moving down the walkway. And it's like looking over a cliff. You know, they might as well mm -hmm. be, be filming someone walking on a tight rope and approaching that back corner with so much apprehension. In broad daylight. Right. Right. Which is the other amazing thing. So, you know, we've done all, it's really all the hard parts of building the scare that we've accomplished. And then when it happens, I actually think the reveal is part of the reason it's scary. The fact that it isn't the way we expect. We expect a quick boo release. And it moves out so slowly that you don't flinch. Because if something had popped out, you would have gone, ah, and looked away. Mm -hmm. But because it moves out slowly... And also, it's covered in black. It looks fucking inhuman. You're staring at it, kind of going, oh, there's a slow thing moving out. This must not be the scare yet. What is this? And then by the time it's fully revealed, your brain's just going, oh my God, what is this thing? And then the scene stops. Pretty fucking amazing. So yeah. much so that every corner for the rest of the film is fucking terrifying to me. <laughs> and so this dumpster person, <laughs> this alley soot person, is I think a big part of the mystery because we see them later with the box, which mm -hmm. is going to become a key point. Sure. And uh, and then there's tiny people in the box, right? Which also is going to uh, well, the tiny people in the box we've already seen at the yeah. I mean, we are we are at what maybe scene three in the film, and tiny people in the box are in the opening credits. Yeah, so right, they're, right. they are one of the first characters we see. Yeah, and remarkably creepy too in that limo. Every time in that car. Every time they show up, because they're in that intro with the dancing when they're standing next to Betty, it feels so heavily like a clue that every time I see them, I'm glued to them as if, ah, right. here come answers. Sure, here be sure. answers. Right. And um but it's, they never do anything that relinquish any information. They just make you uncomfortable. Yeah, and that's one of those lingering questions I have, even going through the movie over and over in my head, is trying to figure out what the significance is. Mm -hmm. So much of this is, what is the significance? But one thing that does tell us is those tiny people illustrate what kind of level of reality we're operating on. Right. Because you and I know there are not actually tiny people coming out of boxes True. in the real world. Mm -hmm. So we are either seeing something uh, hallucinogenic or something supernatural. Sure. And I'm just going to call those the same thing in a movie like this. Sure. Because I feel like the difference is arbitrary. Whichever one makes you happier. You pretend there's supernatural stuff or you go Naomi Watts's characters, one of her many, one of one of her characters is crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So we get past that. And then there's also the espresso scene, which is something that's really intriguing to me, mm -hmm. where they've told Adam that he has to recast his movie and he's going to pick Camilla. And then the guy gets really mad about the espresso and spits it out. What we learn from the scene, I think, is that these two guys are not to be fucked with, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems to generally be the idea. Yeah, I go back and forth on that. Every other time I see it, I go, these guys, yes, not to be fucked with. 
But then I will double think it and overthinking is probably one of the biggest problems with understanding Mulholland Drive. Sure. And go, maybe these guys are full of shit and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they're just... <laughs> you think so? You know, carrying a big stick. Well, here's the thing, right? He certainly doesn't know good espresso if exactly. everyone else is to be believed. That's, that's what I mean. If you're sitting in a room full of people who have disappointed this guy before, right? Mm -hmm. And if, as you say, he's not to be fucked with, what is good espresso? Or is he maybe ordering espresso and he doesn't like it at all? Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Okay. Here's what I do know is that these guys sort of work for the shady organization, mm -hmm. which is uh, another piece of the part of the movie that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. So these guys seem to work for or be in association with uh, Michael J. Anderson's character. Right. His big character. His big character. Yeah. So that's weird enough. <laughs> that's one of those things that, you know, now you see Michael J. Anderson in Twin Peaks and you go, oh, he's normal size. Nothing weird about this talking backwards scene at all. Uh, and then you see him being totally normal, just sitting in a room and you're like, wow, well, he's, he's not really that big. Something weird is going on. <laughs> just David Lynch in, in his fucking mastery, once again, warping uh, reality to make something that, to take really what would have been a convention Michael J. Anderson at his normal height is a creepy weirdo and to defy that by putting him in another body. It's just bizarre. So we only see this guy a couple times. He's sitting in the room. It's dark. Mm -hmm. The other man appears to be very shaken that he's chosen to shut it all down. Right. I guess shut it all down means production, but I feel like there's a double meaning right. here. I have, I have, this is one of the key points within the film that I think it starts unfolding its true nature. Mm -hmm. The film is notably shot in Hollywood. Yeah. It's about Hollywood. It's about making movies. It's about J.J. Abrams before J.J. Abrams was around. <laughs> right. Now, I have this inkling that Michael J. Anderson's character is, for lack of a better word, the king of Hollywood. Okay. There is, there is a basic... It's, it, I don't want to say legend because it feels like he comes out of the misty moors of Yosemite, but there is, you know, a kind of shameful wonder of there being this one pull the string guy, right? Who runs Hollywood, the right. president of Hollywood, the king of Hollywood. Well, what we've Hollywood. just seen is supposed to be like a backdoor Hollywood type meeting, right? Right. Even though it's just a bunch of people in a room talking about what should happen in a movie they're all invested in. Right. It's not really that shady, but yeah. And so what this is to me, so we've seen within the film an actual film production that is going on. Mm -hmm. That has a director and the director is king of that creative situation. Adam. Yeah. King of the Sylvia North story. Now we have somebody higher up than him. Who we can only assume, based on the level of control he seems to have, just at a phone call, sure, that he is running the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, every show. Right. He decides which actors get famous. He decides who gets cast when, when he wants, in what films. And so when he says stop production, I feel like this is the ball rolling on the deaths that we see within the film. Mm. I think this is him going... Okay, well, this plan we had to make this person this person, that's not going to happen now. We're doing a different thing. Okay. I sure. feel like he is, he is the Mephistopheles of Hollywood, basically right. going, choosing whose fortune fades and whose fortune rises. Well, at the very least, we know that Adam's money is shut down and it seems to be as a result of his decisions and later, right. you know, the cowboy being involved in, I believe, that same organization. Agreed. Yeah, the cowboy is is kind of... Now, again, I, I'm going to keep using biblical imagery because of the basic ideology that this film revolves around um, death. There's a lot of death in the, in the, in the mm -hmm. ideology of the film, like from the beginning. And I feel like the cowboy is the Gabriel, the archangel, the angel of death mm -hmm. going, all right, listen, I'm now, I'm the reaper. You have now seen me. Right. Sure. If you see me again, you have done well. 
and you can go on and and continue your purgatorious creation sure. of this film. If you see me another time, that's it. You lose. You're out of heaven. You're out of Hollywood. Right. You're out of the promised right. land. Los Angeles being <laughs> so prevalent as the city of angels. Sure. Okay. There's so, I'll take it. There's so much death imagery. I mean, even the idea of Betty coming to the place where her aunt was. Right. Is kind of alluding to Betty having died, what, 50 years ago when the jitterbug was a popular dance. Right. She still acts like a 50s girl. That's kind of the thing that's really odd about Betty's character Mm -hmm. is that she's going around being a plucky, you know, sunshine and naivete. Starstruck. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not. And and you have to keep in mind, this film came out in, in the early 2Ks. Yeah, well, so did, this is the other question of, is that a David Lynch thing? Right. Or is that a, I mean, we also saw a lot of that in uh, Blue Velvet. Sure. It doesn't necessarily take place in the 50s. Sure. You definitely. know, they're at, a, they're at a diner that looks particularly modern and not mm-hmm. 50s. Mm-hmm. You, you would venture to guess the movie is a modern film, but yeah, there does seem to be a character sure. stuck back in that era, either because David Lynch likes that character, right. that, that look. Or maybe there's some origin in that era. Sure. We're also dealing with this. Uh, uh, what's that idea called? It's it's not a loop. A uh, Mobius strip is that. Yeah. Where yeah. you where you have uh, sort of no beginning and no end. Sure. And it goes backwards and forwards. Right. I don't think Mulholland Drive operates in a loop. Although it's. I agree. It's, I I agree. That's a good way to start to look at it to wrap your head around it. But let's jump to that section and we can mm-hmm. kind of come back and revisit things as, as necessary, I think. She meets up with the woman we'll call Rita, I guess. Mm-hmm. And they go on a, a mystery adventure together to discover Rita's past. And Rita starts getting these clues. Uh, she starts remembering things here and there. Also, way awesome that this uses an amnesia cliche. And I don't even think for a second, like, fuck right. you, amnesia cliche. I'm just like... Oh, well, yeah, she's lost her memory. Okay, totally. Part of that is probably the classic Hollywood that it's invoking, but that mm-hmm. it gets away with that alone is uh, amazing. So she's remembering back to things, certain things kind of flicker in her mind. And, and so that is what progresses our film. These clues she's getting, we go out, we see the uh, Silencio uh, play. Mm-hmm. There is no banda. Mm-hmm. And uh, they go back home. Betty appears to have vanished from the room. And when Rita goes and looks at this box, which she now has a key for, or I should say she now has this box that she had previously had the key for Mm -hmm. stashed away in her stuff in the closet. Uh, Betty has just, you know, has this box now. No one knows where it came from. She puts the key in it. And at least the camera would tell us is sucked into the blackness of the box. Sure. I mean, we really can't say anything more definitively about what happens in that scene, right? Right, right, sure. The camera zooms into the box, it makes a whooshing sound, and then the box winds up on the floor. Mm -hmm. Then we see her aunt return later, and everything is fine. They aren't there, they vacated. So that seems to be part one of the two parts. Mm -hmm. Then there's the part two reality, where we have these same actors... Right. Appearing to play, what, different characters, right? Well, different characters from themselves, but not characters we haven't seen. That's true. Diane is, I guess, Diane is a new character, or at least an unsung character in the origins of the film. Well, I think we've seen Diane's corpse previously, though, right. don't you? Agreed. Yes. Yes. Which didn't, so the first thing for me is the physicality. I'm trying to get over the look. Mm-hmm. So were we actually seeing a dead Naomi Watts before or not? And probably not. Doesn't look like it. Right. Sure. Uh, it's a different actor portraying the corpse. Uh-huh. Then I'm wondering, are people going to recognize uh, Diane as Naomi Watts? So I'm, I'm kind of looking, you know, as that part of the movie is progressing, I'm waiting for somebody to recognize her and go, you're that other girl. But that doesn't seem to happen. Right. Well, and then we get the other character who plays Camilla, whom we've also seen. Mm -hmm. already in the film as the girl who has to be picked to sure uh, be in the sylvia north story and this is now they they invoke the sylvia north story again sure as where camilla and diane met Mm -hmm. there's something about 
the director didn't very much like Diane. And this is a far more broken Hollywood story. Sure. This is the kind of story that drives a Hollywood woman to suicide. Yeah. Very clearly. We get a lot of the same repeated bits of imagery. We get the, we don't stop here at Mulholland Drive. Right. Um, Although, and this is the thing that makes me think not a loop because we're using some of the same footage or looks very, very close to the same footage and we're getting the same lines, but the story's playing differently. Exactly. It's reminding me back to our primer conversations. Mm -hmm. We're starting to think a lot about, you know, is it looping or are there, I don't know, do you ever think separate continuities? Are you starting to think like another reality or another version of the story? I have a different... Do you venture into that territory at all? I don't. I have a different understanding of it. Okay. My understanding is, and now this is this is going to get heady, and I don't need to go into it at length right now, but I believe that the second part of the film is the beginning and end, and that the first part of the film takes place within the chronology of the second part of the film. Okay, sure. Within a split second of the second part of the film is the entire first film's chronology. All right. That's my, and again, predicated on five viewings and some light reading on the subject. So basically, for all intents and purposes, utter and complete garbage. (laughs) Well, all right. So expand on that a little bit while we're on the topic. So I believe, my understanding is such that Diane, when she kills herself, Mm -hmm. in the moments between her laying down on the pillow, which we see in the beginning of the film, right? During the opening credits, we we get the it sounds like somebody sniffing cocaine, and then we the camera falls onto a red pillow, which is the same bed, same room, sure that we find the body in later. Mm -hmm. My belief is. That in the moments before she actually dies, the other story takes place in this kind of more angelic version of Hollywood. Sure. In kind of this this place between living and dying. Well, is this story reality or is this her fantasy? I don't I, d- I don't think it's reality. Mm-hmm. I think it's entirely fantastic because if you look at the characters in the first part of the film, I think this is a genius, an ingenious way to tell the story. You get characters like the hitman, Adam, mm-hmm. the story about Adam's wife cheating on him, and all of this is told in a glorious Hollywood fashion. Right. The hitman looks suave and he's 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 bumbling, but still, you know, it's sure. kind of funny. And Adam is just together and an assertive, I do my own movie. I have artistic credibility and I will not relinquish any power on my film. You get all of these quintessential Hollywood romanced characters that after the first part of the film, everybody's just kind of a bland version of what they were in the first part of the film. Adam well, yeah, Naomi of, Watts specifically looks right. I mean, distinctly different. Sure, you could tell just from looking at a photo of her in one spot or another which character she's playing. Right, and so I feel like Betty is kind of this character that you know, the young romantic. I love Hollywood. It's Diane basically going. This story would have been a better way. Sure, for because okay, right here, Mulholland Drive is a perfect example. The street. In the first part of the film, there's a horrendous car accident and Rita forgets who she is. Mm -hmm. In the second part of the film, which I believe is the beginning part chronologically, at the same moment, that is where Naomi Watts finds out that her girlfriend is getting married. Right. Cataclysmic event that changes her understanding of that person. So the continuity is the next thing that I address after kind of figuring out the physicality. Mm -hmm. Physicality, uh, and when I say that, I mean people we've seen before look at these actors in role and see them as the new characters, not as the old characters. Mm -hmm. And we see that with the woman from Apartment 12. Mm -hmm. And then later we see it most strikingly with Coco. Right. Who mentions that she is Coco in both timelines. Mm Mm-hmm. And should recognize both, if not at least one of them, and doesn't seem and to... ends up being Adam's mother. Well, right. That's the crazy thing is Adam's mother would recognize 
sure. Rita as Rita if that had happened. Right. No matter where that happens chronologically, Adam's mother should recognize, oh, you're my son's fiance mm -hmm. or you're that crazy girl from that apartment. Right. If he doesn't recognize uh, Betty, which he should, as Betty, mm -hmm. but instead recognizes Betty as, well, doesn't recognize her, but is introduced to her for the first time genuinely as Diane. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm thinking, well, it's got to be different continuities because Coco seems like a key here. She would, she's sure. going to recognize one or the other, or she's the same Coco in two different realities. But Adam mentions i got the pool she got the pool man it seems to suggest the same continuity don't you think sure in fact it almost throws a wrench in what you're saying it seems to suggest that that bit happens after the hollywood you know billy ray cyrus uh, is sleeping <laughs> with my girlfriend although if these are you know if the beginning piece is hollywood fantasy then diane could have heard that story over dinner sure. about adam leaving exactly and she's now conceptualizing this fantasy exactly. where someone like Billy Ray Cyrus right. had been. Exactly. You know. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of the point. Now, for me, the only thing that is left outside of the chronology is and, and I mean we're gonna come back to it eventually. We knew we were going to, is the dumpster person. Sure. Now, okay, I will I will be completely transparent. I have read a lot on what the fuck it that's about. <laughs> the dumpster person <laughs> and and me being me and and our listeners know me and you know me better than our listeners most of the shit i read i just get angry and i say that is absolutely right. not the case <laughs> right sure i've read things about the dumpster person being the devil i've read things about the dumpster person is an alien not there at all the sum of a the sum of one's fears. Uh, some people seem to believe that it's actually another incarnation of diane yeah well, so this is, yeah, I mean, on enough loops, that would be, sure. now we're starting to talk about triangle, triangle. a little bit. <laughs> right. Same actor. <laughs> Wait, what? The, uh, the character who plays Camilla is, oh, is in wow. triangle. <laughs> I didn't, yeah. The original, the first part Camilla. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Well, and so you've invoked a little bit of religious imagery. Yes. And I think that's helpful insofar as to understand other characters uh -huh. or the places we're trying to go in the story. Right. I don't think you're going to explain something away by going, the dumpster person's literally the devil. Right. And, you know, right. Michael Agreed. Anderson is literally God. Right. But this might help to think about, all right, if, well, for one, if David Lynch is actually using uh, religious iconography, mm -hmm. then he might be using it in other places we haven't thought of yet, and that might further inform a character. Sure. A character like Gabriel that you mentioned. Uh-huh. Not something I was even thinking about, but now that you mention it, I kind of see, okay, well, what might have happened if Adam didn't agree? Right. I don't know before talking to you, but you mentioned Gabriel and I go, well, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a little bit further a clue. Well, also the the other question that I have regarding the cowboy or Gabriel is we see him three times. Mm -hmm. Adam sees him twice. There's Adam's encounter with the cowboy. Right. Uh, with the threat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it a threat. And man, the assumptions you can or can't make in this movie, that's another tricky part right. of Mulholland Drive is there's so much, uh -huh. you know, I almost have to write down everything I know and then <laughs> take all the things that are assumptions and circle them and move them out. Um, there's the, the time he has the conversation about him being a smart aleck. And right. then there's the background at the party. Right. And then there's also time to wake up, pretty girl. Oh, that's true. That, so I didn't we think see about him that. three times. Right. Adam sees him twice. Sure. So he seems to be a conduit into that other world too. Right. But now this is, again, this is another stretch that actually pulls a lot of things together. Adam sees this guy twice, which in Adam's reality means he did well and he is going to be okay. Sure. You and I and all of the listeners who spent the time watching Mulholland Drive have seen the cowboy three times, which means we have done wrong. If, again, based on the assumption right. that based his on... rules work for us. Sure, well. right. Well, so, but that that's the thing, is we are the only people that get to, again, in my understanding, see death and see the other side of death. Mm. Because Adam obviously doesn't. And we're seeing, first of all, I mean, obviously we see a dead body. But based on my assertion that this kind of Los Angeles City of Angels romantic 
twilight of undying story goes on Mm -hmm. in the realm of death we see the cowboy three times right we get to go okay we're taking a peek behind the curtain sure i think that that's a clue i think that us seeing him three times to adam's two means we get a tiny bit more exposition because we we get to see something Adam never gets. So you kind of have to right. go, what? To, and obviously there's a grand list of things. Sure. That obviously Adam us doesn't see the viewers and Adam being a character. Well, that's the hard thing too, is we don't have, we're not getting a point of view that lines up with any single character. Exactly. So we can't go, you know, uh, in these other movies that we've seen that deal with weird time conundrums or, or alternate realities or continuities, we can at least follow a single character through different mm-hmm. things. Right. Or we can attempt to do that. In Mahal and Drive, I don't know if we're following Rita or following Betty. And then later, I'm starting to think, I mean, I get the, every time I see it, it changes. Yeah. But I get the impression that the beginning two hours of the film that's the throwaway part and the critical reality part is the last half hour agreed right that we shouldn't be saying naomi watts plays betty we should be saying she plays diane okay and betty is just this other weird part of it now allow me to make this a little more confusing if i may mm-hmm. this is my thesis on the subject i think we're following naomi watts okay not betty not diane I think we're following Naomi Watts because we've already seen that this film is a meta Hollywood experience. Uh huh. We're in Hollywood. We've seen the making of a film where characters play characters and actors play actors and actors play characters and actors and play two characters. Yeah. And then two, one character is played by two actors. We're just right. Fucking we around a- with the humanity within the film. Yeah. The only thing that we have a grasp on is Naomi Watts as a human being. Familiarity is based on Naomi Watts, first person we see in both realities. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit before we went on the air about David Lynch's top 10 list of clues that he's given. Probably time to bring that up too. There's, I mean, they're just as cryptic, if not more cryptic than the film itself. And so I would definitely recommend watching the movie a couple times before even looking at the list because it will cloud your understanding of the film. It also includes that reference to the red lamp that I joked about. Yes. I guess that yes. was really a thing. <laughs> so what you're talking about, there is a, a DVD insert that, it, uh, you know, it's David Lynch's, or at least that's what the insert says, David Lynch's 10 mm-hmm. clues to Mulholland Drive or whatever. Yeah. Uh, which I think might have just been written by a production aide at the DVD factory uh-huh. and then stamped with the seal of, of approval. But it seems like a very non-David Lynch thing to give sure. clues to his films. Sure. But I mean, I might be speaking totally, you know, out of my area of expertise here. But one of the clues, and this is, I, I, I will be completely honest. I take and leave the clues based on, on sure. where I find truth in the information. Yeah, we weren't even totally sure they were relevant for our conversation. Right. Exactly. I think they might get us off track. So look them up. We'll put them on the website. Yeah. But there is one, one thing that is mentioned in that list about Club Silencio. And obviously, regardless of the list, Club Silencio is incredibly important within the film. Incredibly important. And we haven't mentioned it yet. <laughs> this is a thick film, Michael. There is, it's a very densely packed. So the entirety of Club Silencio is based on this is all recorded. This has all happened before. Right. This isn't happening now. Yeah. So that is, no, I'm going to ask you to try to follow me, Eric, because I'm going to need you to reflect on this after I get done, because this is the part I'm not sure about. So this also uh, seems to, before we really get into this, this also seems to to suggest loop more than Mobius strip, that idea of pre-recorded. Right. A recording is one reality. It can be played over and over. Mm -hmm. A Mobius strip folds onto itself and has no, I mean, I guess the, the important part of the definition is it has no definitive beginning or end. Right. But here is my understanding of Club Silencio within that. Okay. And this is, again, this is still outside of it being a loop. Mm Mm-hmm. A recording is recorded one time and then played again, played back. And we don't get repetitive playback. We get a single playback. Right. So 
as I was saying before, Diane's story happens basically almost in full entirety before Betty's story. Right. Both Naomi Watts. Now, if we are to believe that that story, Diane's story, was recorded in the mind of Naomi Watts, it's Diane. And then in the moments of her passing, it's replayed through her mind again. Only it's more grandiose and it's more beautiful. Right. And it's perfect that way because nothing can go wrong this time. Mm -hmm. It's entirely beautiful and perfect. And every beat will be hit. Every note will be perfectly in tune. Women will be singing gloriously heartbreaking renditions right. of Roy Orbison songs sure. without missing a breath. And it is at Club Silencio that we get the box. Mm -hmm. It is immediately following Club Silencio that Bet Naomi Watts, okay, Betty, Diane, don't know which one she truly is, but Naomi Watts goes, this totally all happened before. Right. I'm realizing, I'm remembering and that's why she disappears, because if we're to believe that this is in the moments of Diane's dying, or if I'm to believe it, right, she has to actually die. The brain has to stop. And you and I being of an atheist persuasion in so much that we are atheists. <laughs> sure. Her spirit isn't going to live on as an angel Naomi Watts. Right. When Diane's brain function finally stops on that pillow, so then must Betty. Yeah. And so that's why she disappears. And that's why the box brings about, it's basically the final sure. stage okay. of okay. an entire reality that is right. garnered at the club with a key that we've had from the beginning of this story, right. which is the idea of the memory of a past life that fits perfectly into the end of this one. Okay. All right. So if I, if I follow you here. Yes. What we're saying is Naomi Watts, she's laying down in the bed, probably as Diane. She's recounting episodes from her life and uh, things connected to her life, mm -hmm. probably as Betty, uh, where she is Betty in this. Right. In this sort of about to die fantasy mm -hmm. and uh, possibly drug induced. Yeah. It's uh, a fantasy. euphoric. I'm, I'm definitely euphoric in some fashion. Sure. Um, there's tiny people. So again, let's go back to something is hallucinogenic somewhere in the film. Uh -huh. There are not really tiny people unless Mulholland Drive is a totally naturalistic movie that takes place in a universe where there are tiny people. All right. I've seen Mondo Kane. There's no tiny people anywhere in the world. All right. So she's thinking about herself as Betty. In this world as Betty, she comes with the key that will eventually reconnect her to reality where she will die. Exactly. Where she will fizzle out. Right. And at the point where she has the box, that's when her brain is starting to, real life Diane's brain is starting to flicker back to reality. It's starting to go, all right, this little pre-death or moment of death fantasy is about to collapse now that reality's seeping back in. Mm -hmm. It's the state when you're so hard to do this without invoking dreams because yeah. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to yeah, give I'm any credence to any kind of dream nonsense. Yeah. But it is the moment where you're kind of waking up mm -hmm. and you're sort of going uh, half dreaming, half awake. You are grounded in reality and you realize you're dreaming. And I think when she has the box, what you're saying, when she has the box, she's going, oh, fuck, this is a fantasy. Wait, I kind of right. know this is, is this, a, I kind of get this. Yeah. And they race home. And at the point where she is no longer in the room, that's where she's either connected, it's a fantasy or her brain has ceased to function. She is dead. Right. Okay. All right. I'm following this. That is that is that is what I that is what I think Club Silencio is all about. Is it's the moment within the story where it goes, This has happened before. Right. There is no band. Right. Because this has happened and is recorded in perfection this way. The stage show of Club Silencio is communicating to her her own, you know her own worst fears that she's trying exactly. to not think about, that her exactly. fantasy is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Club Silencio is the, hey, wake up, your fantasy is a fantasy. Right. Um, you also, I mean, you run the constant risk, we do this on the show all the time, but especially now, of over-interpreting, as you said. Sure, sure. But there are a lot of moments around, I mean, I think it might be easy enough just to chuck a bunch of dream stuff into the movie, show characters waking up and cameras falling into beds and... Some of these are red herrings or mm -hmm. pieces perhaps we're connecting that aren't meant to be connected. As Ebert says, perhaps there is no mystery. But 
It is interesting to me that Rita wakes Betty up to drag her to Club Silencio. It is a sort of wake-up call to her fantasy coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Or it's totally not that. I mean, you know, also an option. Right. All right, so I have a pretty good uh, idea of your understanding of the film. And like I said, Mm -hmm. I think you have to introduce some concept of fantasy to it. Sure. Because of these continuity problems of things like Coco. But I'm also wondering about... Adam seeming to have recognized Diane, uh, seeming to have recognized Betty in the moment that he first saw her. Do you get that sense? Uh, I guess the question I want to go back to is interpretation and assumption. Mm -hmm. So Betty walks in after her own Hollywood audition. And which, by the way, quick aside, Naomi Watts just fucking rocks it all over the place. Oh, yeah. Seeing Naomi Watts in her rehearsal with Rita Mm -hmm. of the scene she's about to do. I watched and I go, wow, Naomi Watts is fucking incredible. It's like she just transformed into another person. And then you see her do the exact same scene, but totally differently in the actual rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, full of eroticism and lust and blue velvet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Dennis Hopper is watching them out of frame, you know, masturbating. (laughs) Uh, It's just a totally different scene. And Naomi Watts, fucking incredible. I know we talked about her a bit on Funny Games and being involved in a in a production uh, role in a lot of these things she puts on. She just mm-hmm. she just has her hand in a lot of interesting uh, stuff. I get the feeling she is a David Lynch kind of fan herself. She probably watches a lot of weird stuff. Love Naomi Watts. Anyways, she goes to see Adam. The two women uh, bring mm-hmm. her to go see Adam, and Adam stares at her kind of a lot Mm -hmm. what's that about my understanding is so we find out in the reality of in diane's story we'll call it that Uh we'll call in diane's story right we find out that adam did not direct the sylvia north story right that it was instead i believe and i could be misremembering but i believe the director of the sylvia north story was actually the person who naomi watts auditioned for as betty yeah okay i remember that name being thrown around now we're starting to get into a spot where i'm disappointing myself by not having the information i could i don't remember the name but i don't necessarily think that it's that important because okay again based on my understanding betty is supposed to be secretly the greatest actor that has ever walked the streets of hollywood sure because diane was jilted by first off jilted by camilla for falling in love with one director. And also she says herself, the director didn't like her very much on the Sylvia North story. Right now. Right. This is the Sylvia North story, right? Sure. Now we finally get the only director that she's really known as Diane gets to be directing right. the Sylvia North story. And even though he is magnetically for whatever reason, drawn to Betty, just under no circumstances could he possibly make a different decision. The Lord of Hollywood is basically tying his hands going, you have to choose Camilla. It's literally over his shoulder, breathing right. down his neck. And so I think that this is a way of Naomi Watts reconciling how she couldn't, how, how she could have been so despised when she's such a wonderful choice. Okay. And so instead- How Diane in her fantasy would right. be- how yes, she, yeah, okay. she would be like, she's she's basically reconciling, I had that because I am fantastic. There must have been some odious force right. pull, moving the hands of that sure. director, sure. preventing me from being the one. Again, in a story where the reality of it is that Diane is the tangible real world person, she is having right. a fantasy, she's looking back playing this character of Betty in her fantasy. Mm -hmm. Betty, by the way, the name of the waitress that Diane sees. Right. Whereas, strangely, Diane is the name of the waitress that Rita sees. Right. So I think that that's also a moment where Betty, in her fantasy, is saying, how does Rita get this clue? She looks at the name tag of the waitress, the same waitress I looked at the name tag of to get my Uh fantasy name. Right. All right. So... You're saying that you don't think that look that Adam gives is his moment of recognition. No. You're saying that he's going, wow, I'm captivated mysteriously by Betty because she's an amazing force 
too bad I can't cast her. Otherwise, exactly. I would instantly give her a part even without an audition. Right. That's what I'm thinking. Right. After she just came from an audition where she nailed it, but it's beneath her. Yep. All right. So I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of at least one way to view this film. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there are, you know, there's a multitude of interpretations and ways you can do this. Uh, I, I like ours the best uh-huh. that we're crafting here. <laughs> And I think we haven't found a lot of holes to poke in it yet. Sure. Although double feature show at gmail.com. Also, we could just watch the movie one more time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And it'll all fall apart. We should do this every time we see and Drive. It's, I'll just call you and we'll record another fucking show. We'll have, you know, and Drive is less than three hours and we'll have nine hours of commentary on it. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit just in wrapping this up about uh, Rita. Sure. Who is played by Laura Herring. Now, Rita, uh, or I guess I should say Camilla, real world, end of movie Camilla Herring, (laughs) Camilla Herring, appears to have crossed Diane Watson, and uh, so Diane has her killed, Mm -hmm. orders her execution, Mm -hmm. and we're to believe that's a real thing. So we come back around to the beginning of the movie where we are seeing an execution, or or a botched execution. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, tell me in, in your sort of interpretation of this, when we see her in the limo in the beginning of the movie and the limo stops and the guy points the gun at her in very much the same fashion as that kind of frightening limo ride that Diane had taken, had just mm-hmm. taken before, you know, kind of laying down and thinking about this. Are we in fantasy then? So the fantasy does not begin with amnesia and running away. Right. We've already started the fantasy, you would say. Yeah. This is a fantasy that Diane is having about right. maybe how was Camilla killed. Sure. Maybe they took her in a limo, much yeah. like my own limo. I have, I have three points of understanding here to, the, to that question. Mm-hmm. One is, I think part of it is a, a false hope that maybe the execution went wrong. And right. Camilla wasn't actually killed by the hand of Naomi Watts. And instead something else happened that was just as good as her dying, which is to say she lost her entire memory and was drawn back right to Naomi Watts. Sure. So I think that I think too, I think that is why Rita shows up with the bag full of money. I think that that is the memory of the bag full of money that she gave to the hitman. Mm -hmm. That is her going, hey, so here's this bag of money. How does this play into anything? Well, and also she just gave away all this money, which I exactly. mean, again, let's over, over-interpret for a moment. That's a lot of money to be given away. Sure. I'm sure she would have gladly exchanged that money for Camilla to just come back to her. But also in an ideal fantasy, it'd be really nice if Camilla came with a bag of money that happened to be how much money she just lost yeah. on this hit that didn't go through. Right. And then I think that Thirdly, when we finally do see the hitman kind of bumbling and failing and I mean, he he hits his mark, but only barely. And he just right. makes a he makes a, a huge mess of it. I think that that's another point of Naomi Watts, Diane, her fantasy going, maybe this guy's just no good. Yeah. And also maybe he's not going to come back and involve me at any point. Right. He's yeah. not going to be haunting her because he totally right. fucked up. He'll get himself caught. Yeah. And then, you know, he's no longer going to be a problem. Exactly. Yeah. It does seem to wash her hands pretty clean. Yeah. Uh, feed into that even further that, you know, uh, Betty seems to be in love with Rita really quickly without them uh, basically knowing each other at all. Sure. It also plays into that that right. fantasy idea. Well, and Rita being an amnesiac, she's absolutely dependent and needs Betty. Yeah. It's the one way outside of lesbian lust that Naomi Watts can ensure Camilla won't leave her because not only now, not only does she only have a single friend and it is Betty, but Betty has so much leverage on the criminal background of this character. So that seems to wrap things up pretty well with the exception, uh, I guess, of the one time we also see... Um, see Laura as uh, Camilla immediately after the switchover. Mm-hmm. The woman from apartment 12 comes back over and she demands her ashtray. By the way, just because we're making this as complicated as possible, do you get the impression there was anything sexual going on there? I don't know. 
Yes, it's, but I they're don't switching know. apartments. Yeah. There seems to be like a angry love thing going on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I I thought I'd ask. She comes back, gets her ashtray, and then we immediately see, I guess now Camilla in this world appear on her couch, uh, talk to her, and then just appear on her couch naked, and they have sex, mm-hmm. and the ashtray is uh, still there. Right. So I'm thinking in my mind, and I imagine this is the same spot that you're in. That we are looking at uh, kind of another mini fantasy here. Sure. That we're just looking at a one-off fantasy, not in the the Betty sense, but just in real world Diane imagining real world Camilla back on her couch. Perhaps a precursor to the the two-hour beginning of the movie fantasy. She's sitting there just trying to sexually imagine Camilla again. And we see her not able to do that, you know, adequately. We see her uh, masturbating in lens whacking. Right. It's really funny that, that David Lynch has now linked to lens whacking and masturbating together. Thanks for that. But the heavily defocused lens stuff that we talked about in mm-hmm. Lost Highway, we're now seeing Naomi Watts' character. We're seeing Diane try and have a sexual fantasy about Camilla and, you know, the, the simple sexual fantasy isn't working. Right. What does end up working is the long, elaborate sure. fantasy later. That would explain how Camilla has entered the apartment so abruptly right. without anybody seeing her, why the ashtray is there, and then why she just kind of seems to disappear. I think it's either that or a look, it's a memory into the moments that they broke up because there'd be too short of a time span. The film would have to be another two hours long to show them breaking up and immediately go to the dinner party where she's now getting married to Adam. That's, that's probably more accurate, but I still, I mean, I agree. I think it is a fantasy, but I think it's, it's a fantasy based on memory as opposed to a fantasy based on desire. Yeah, good. So that, that falls into this hypothesis as well. As I'm thinking back to a lot of these lingering questions I have, they, they all kind of come back nicely into this. I mean, Seeing the actress we thought was Camilla at the party mm-hmm. suddenly makes sense because that's the, this is very similar to the Shark Boy and Lava Girl, Aesop. Mm-hmm. The idea of people from your real reality entering and playing a role in your dreams. Right. In this way, maybe Shark Boy and Lava Girl wasn't a terrible pick. It, it kind of informs Shark Boy and Lava Girl is the answer to the mystery of Mulholland Drive. <laughs> yeah, I think it's saying people from your reality will show up in your dream. <laughs> That's why Camilla plays, you know, the actress who actually got the part in the fantasy that Betty is in. Right. Because Camilla was somebody they saw at the dinner. I do think it's odd that Adam is recasting his lead actress uh, when, we, when we see these fantasy conversations. I'm really interested to know, is that because his last actress was killed in a car crash and went missing? Or how does that play into the, I mean, what do you think about that? How does that play into the reality level of the, the movie? Do you get a sense that his actress is being recast because of the car crash? Or is that not working in our fantasy continuity? Okay, so my understanding of that would be something more in the meta sense of the actual actress being recast. Now, it, it would be Laura Herring now being replaced. Okay. Because Laura Herring is filling the role of Rita right now. But we're we're speaking about this metaphorically. Right. Then. We're not yeah. we're not actually saying we're picking up the continuity yeah. from the reality because of the car crash. Right, exactly. I know I said we wouldn't do it on the show, but I really love hearing your David Lynch voice. Could you just <laughs> read the one about the the red lamp, maybe? Uh yeah. I, I need to pull it up really quick. Yeah, you'll find that uh in your messages window right under the naked picture of Laura Herring and uh the pictures of Taylor Lauten next to a llama. Oh yeah, there it is. Perfect. I don't have any naked Naomi Watts in this window for some reason, uh, although we really should. I feel like I'm objectifying her to say Naomi Watts is gorgeous naked, but I can't seem to care about that. Hint number two on Lynch's 10 clues for understanding Mulholland Drive. Oh, that one was short. I want a longer one. (laughs) I'll give you a longer one. Pay particular attention to the beginning of the film. At least two clues are revealed before the credits. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to link off to, I haven't read through this yet. It would probably have been, you know, you and I have a problem in any kind of deconstruction of this. 
in that there's just too much to read. We would never get to. We've waited six years to do this fucking show. <laughs> like, we just can't go through it all. But this website, I'll link to it on our site. It has David Lynch's 10 Clues, which I think, I, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say they're red herrings, but uh, it's just a, honestly, man, it's another hour long conversation. <laughs> uh, there's also, it looks like the website has a breakdown of things right. regarding the clues. So this is really interesting. I would be um, very behind revisiting Mahon Drive in some capacity at some point, despite that we've talked about it an absurdly long amount of time. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how or why we do that, but um, definitely something I'd want to do. So the website is doublefeatureshow.com and the email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Uh, the executive producers for today's show are Flint Ironstag. Maxwell Harley, Meta Somerville, and uh, Hannah Hughes. Uh, I'll never get enough of that. I feel really good about our Mulholland Drive conversation. Yeah. I, I, I love thinking about these as the definitive conversations about XYZ. Right. Even though you and I could never have a definitive conversation about fucking anything. <laughs> but at least, you know, in our own continuity, I'd like to thank the... Right. A definitive conversation about Mulholland Drive, first of all, would not reference the triangle and Shark Boy and Lava Girl as right. serious pieces of... Correct. Uh, ...an explanation of the uh, the film. But man, there it is. And uh, I, I don't want to be done with David Lynch. I want to do more David Lynch on the show. But it'll have to wait because we got a totally different plan next time. Next time we're going to do kids films for grownups. Uh, we're going to do Paranorman. We're sticking that next to Fantastic Mr. Fox, making Wes Anderson officially a thing we do on Double Feature. There it is. Watch more fucking film. Bye.